Today we're going to learn about heating and cooling curves. Uh, it would be helpful if you go to Canvas and print. There's a handout on Canvas that has six of the slides on it. There's a few more slides, but if you get those six, it'll, it'll make this go a little bit faster. So heating and cooling. Uh, this is what a heating curve looks like for water. This is taking water at 10 degrees Celsius, taking it from solid ice, and then we see here that we have this process from ice to liquid. That, of course, is melting. Another word for melting, which we learned hopefully today in lab, is fusion. F F U S I O N. So that's fusion. Fusion is another word for melting. And then we have the temperature of the water increasing. Then we have water going to steam. Another word for that is vaporization. And then we have steam. A couple of different things going on here. We're adding energy. Anytime we're adding energy, we would call this endothermic. So this is endothermic because energy is being put into there. Other thing we want to look at is the change in energy. Anytime the uh, temperature is changing, we're increasing kinetic energy. So at area one, we'll call this area one, area three, uh, and area five, we have a temperature change. So at those areas one, three, and five, you're going to have an increase in kinetic energy. But if you see at the flat areas where the energy is not increasing, the temperature is not changing, but energy is going somewhere. So at the uh, what I call area two, the area where it's melting or fusion, or area four where we see it's going from water to steam or it's vaporizing, this is area four, at those areas we have an increase in potential energy. So the energy is going in to make not the molecules move faster, but break the bonds to go from a solid liquid, solid ice to liquid water, liquid water to steam. So those are the main points from this curve. And you see where, where water freezes and melts at zero degrees Celsius, where it boil, where it condenses, and where it changes to steam is 100 degrees Celsius. I think you probably knew those already. So heating changes in a heating curve, two of the things we want to note are, first, we have two processes going on. The first process is the fusion, F-U-S-I-O-N, which is melting. And you see energy is being put into, so this is an endothermic process. It requires energy to break those bonds to go from a solid to a liquid. Then we see vaporization going from a liquid to a gas. Energy is required for that, and so this is vaporization. Uh, no, now notice, notice both of these processes are once again endothermic. So what do you think? Mark all that applies. Uh, hopefully you use primitive analysis. This, this will make this part go a little bit faster. The flat lines on the heating curve represent a temperature change, a constant temperature, a change of state. Mark all that apply. We'll come back to that in a second. Next question. The slope lines on a heating curve represent a temperature change, a constant temperature, a change of state. So let's see the answers for these. So the first one, the answers are the flat lines on a heating curve represent a constant temperature. If it's flat, notice temperature is on your y-axis, so if it's flat, temperature is not changing. And it's also a change of state. That's where we see it melting or fusion, or we see it's vaporizing going from a liquid to a uh, gas. And the next question, the slope lines on a heating curve represent, and that's just one thing, a temperature change. Now notice we could also say in the uh, flat, the lines that are flat represent an increase in potential energy, and the slope lines increase and increase represent an increase in kinetic energy, because kinetic energy, increase in kinetic energy represents an increase in temperature. Those two things are the same. So let's keep going here. So basically the temperature changes, remember this is what we call, hopefully you remember that term, this is a state function, it just remembers it matters where you start and where you finish. So we have two different temperature changes, the temperature change from, you can look at the temperature change from uh, ice to melting, from a liquid to a vapor, so you have a couple different temperature changes on the graph. So the cooling curve, how would a cooling curve, the first curve we had solid ice going to liquid water as we added heat, then we had liquid water going to a vapor. Could you do the opposite? Could you do a vapor going to liquid water and then to solid ice? Definitely, and this is what it looked like. So we have vapor starting off at 140 degrees Celsius. Then we were removing kinetic energy. The molecules are beginning to move slower and slower. We're uh, slowing them down by taking away energy. Uh, notice that other graph we said that was endothermic. That, th that means this graph is exothermic. The reason it is exothermic is that we're removing energy. Energy is being removed from the substance. 
This is not a reaction, this is a process. We're changing state. So first, the vapor is slowing down, so we're increase, uh, decreasing the kinetic energy. Then right here, this is a process of a liquid going to, uh, I'm sorry, a gas going to a liquid. Does anybody know what that's called? If you said condensation, you were right. That's condensation right there. And then we have it going from a vapor to a, this is basically a liquid cooling down. So in this section right here, we have it's all liquid and it's cooling down. Now, another thing you should note on these charts, you should know what states exist at each section of the graph. At the first uh, section here, we have only a gas. At this metal section, and this is true for the cooling curve as well, you'd have a gas and a liquid. At this portion of the graph, you'd have a liquid only. At the flat portion here, you have a liquid and a solid. And then here, you'd have simply a solid. And so a couple other things you might notice about this. One, what would we call this portion right here? This would be called melting. So you're removing energy. Uh, it's, it's taking away the potential energy. And so you're melting it. You're going from a liquid uh, to a, uh, you're going from a liquid to a solid. So I'm sorry, you're not melting it, you're freezing it. So that would be freezing right there. So condensation, then freezing. And so once again, this is freezing. R E E Z I N G freezing, going from a liquid to a solid. And then this is just taking our solid piece of ice and making it colder and colder. So in all these modes, notice energy is removed. So if we were to write this process, notice energy would be a reactant or a product. What do you think? If it's removed, it's going to be a product. So let's keep going. So this is what the state change looks like. So notice we have a gas going to liquid. That's condensation, so energy is removed right here. So that means it's an exothermic process. And then we have the other one when we have a liquid going to solid. This is freezing, and that is also an exothermic process. So both of these are exothermic. So energy is being removed. Now let's contrast that. One way I help always remember this is I know you have to break bonds or it takes a little bit, you have to put energy in to melt something. So for example, if you've ever held a piece of ice in your hand, the warmth or the energy from your body helps melt that piece of ice. So the energy helps, goes to that solid ice, breaks the bonds, those bonds between the solid ice water molecules and makes it a liquid. So that's an endothermic process. So if you can remember that, remember the opposite would be an exothermic. And similarly, we've mentioned this before, if you take liquid water, like if you want to boil water and create steam, you add energy to it. So that's endothermic as well. So remember, both of these are endothermic processes, whereas the opposite would be an exothermic process. So what do you think, Mark? All that applies. Let's do some questions. Water condenses at a temperature of? At a temperature of zero, water will do what? When water condenses, heat is? Hopefully you remember what condensation is, and freezing is what? So let's see how you do on these. So the first one, water condenses at a temperature of, the answer should be 100 degrees Celsius. At a temperature of 0 degrees Celsius, not only does water freeze, but it also melts. And then the next one, when water condenses, heat is going to be released. And the last one, freezing is an exothermic process. Moving right along, we're doing pretty well right now. So what do you think? Is energy absorbed or released in each of the following? Ice to water. So when you take ice, which is solid water, and you go to liquid water, is energy released or absorbed? When water vapor goes to rain, is energy released or absorbed? And when water goes to ice, is energy released or absorbed? So we'll see if you can answer those three. And also, when it rains, the air becomes warmer, cooler, or does not change. See if we can see how you did on these. So here are the answers. Ice to water. Energy is going to be absorbed. It takes energy to break those bonds to go from a solid to a liquid, so that's definitely absorbing energy. Now the other two are ones that don't make it as intuitive as much sense usually, but if you think of the opposite, it helps a little bit. Water vapor to rain. So you're going from a gas to a liquid, so anytime you go from a state that's further, the particles are further apart to closer together, is going to be releasing energy. So that would be two. And then water to ice is also releasing energy. One way to think about that is when you create ice, you put it, you want to put water in your freezer, 
Now you're releasing energy out of the back of your freezer because you have those coils in the back and you're taking energy out. You have free on your, in your uh, refrigerator that's working to do that. So when it rains, the air becomes warmer would be the answer for that one. So let's. So what do you think? One more set of questions using the terms gains or loses. In cooling, the cooling coils of refrigerator, liquid freon blanks heat from the food and changes it to gas. And the next question, food blanks heat, either gains or loses heat, and becomes cooler, colder. The next one, in the back of the refrigerator, freon blanks heat and condenses back to a liquid. So let's see how you did these. So the first one, in heating coils, in the cooling coils of a refrigerator, liquid freon absorbs heat from the food and changes it to gas. So it, that's what keeps it cooler, they're absorbing heat. So that would be an endothermic process. The next one, food loses heat and becomes cooler. That would be an exothermic process. And then the last one, in the back of the refrigerator, Freon loses heat and condenses back to liquid. Okay, finally, <coughs> sorry, we're going to have two calculations to do here. The first one to calculate the heat it takes to melt 1,250 grams of ice. Remember, melt is another word for fusion. And then the second question, we're going to see, calculate the heat uh, it takes for water to go from 0 degrees Celsius to 37 degrees Celsius. Well, these are two questions. Let's go to the next slide. So the first question, the heat, to heat, the heat <laughs> sorry, calculate the heat to melt 1,250 grams of ice. That's the fusion value. So what you're going to do for this, it's a little bit different. You're just going to take your mass and multiply by a specific value. This is a heat of fusion of water. Every substance has a different heat of fusion, and you'll be given those in a table. So you just have to find, remember, fusion's melting, and multiply that by your mass. Your grams cancel, and you're left with your answer in joules. Your answer for this is a whopping 418,000 joules. So that's the first part of the problem. So we melted ice, and we so we melted. So we're just on that flat part of the curve. So what we did is that's, that's a potential energy portion. Next, step three. So we're, this is the third part of the graph. We're going to take water, and we're going to take it from 0 degrees Celsius to 37 degrees Celsius. That's actually body temperature, 37 degrees Celsius. For this, that's liquid water, so actually we're going to use a number we're familiar with, an equation we're familiar with. That's Q is equal to M times C times delta T. So now we can use a formula we've used. Now before, if you're, that, you use this formula whenever you're changing temperature. If you're not changing the temperature, you simply multiply the mass by the heat of fusion, vaporization, condensation, whatever process is occurring. So let's see what, how that one works. So we take the same mass, because we have the same amount of water, multiply by the temperature change, and then multiply the heat of fusion. I just inverted those two terms, but it works out the same way. And then you end up with 193,000 joules. So to get the total amount of heat to, take, to melt ice and uh, 1,250 grams of ice, and then, then get it to 37 grams of water, or 37 degrees Celsius would be adding both these values together. And so notice we're only using part of this curve. We're melting it, and then we're going to 37, so we're just go taking water from uh, melting up until about right here. What we should be able to do is use any portion of the graph. So this would be the uh, specific heat of ice, in this section, we use a specific heat of water. And this one, you use a specific heat of the vapor. This one, you'd use a delta H of vaporization, or the heat of vaporization. Uh, I'm sorry. This would be the heat of fusion. I apologize. And this right here would be the heat of vaporization. So you actually have five different values to do calculations on this table. I've just shown you two, and that's what we're going to be working on tomorrow in class. So if we want to know the values for just that small portion, all you do is simply add those together and it took a whopping 611,000 joules, or you could just say 611 kilojoules. And so that was the energy to do that one, just that one portion of the graph. We should be able to do all the portions of the graph. That's it. Let me know if you have any questions. Thank you.